In reality television, the people are represented by two separate but equally obsessed attorneys. This is their podcast. Hi, I'm Ceci. And I'm Angela. And this is the Bravo Docket. Hey, legal team, we are back for part two of one of our most requested episodes, which is Bethany's divorce. If you haven't listened to part one, go ahead and do that. In part one, we go through all the details of how they met, and we get up into the point of Bethany getting her apartment back after the divorce has been filed. So that's what we're going to pick up now. So now we're on to September 2016. Now, obviously, we said that during the divorce proceedings, Bethany demanded in her divorce petition that she be declared the true owner of the apartment and that Hoppy had no rights per their prenuptial agreement. And then we just talked about how she had the trust invalidated. Well, she didn't have it invalidated. The judge was like, this is not right. And then, of course, Hoppy was trying to say, no, I'm entitled to half. So finally, after the trust was invalidated, the title of the home was transferred 100 percent to Bethany. And then... Hobby was forever barred from claiming interest in it. And then this was in Architectural Digest. And it said she purchased the 3,007. Wow, I didn't realize it was that big. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big. Yeah. For a New York apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's bigger than my house. (laughs) But still not big enough to avoid your spouse. Oh, no. Yeah. No, absolutely not. But it's still, I'm still amazed at how big that is. So according to Architectural Digest, she purchased the 3,725 square foot Tribeca loft for $4.9 million through a trust when she was still married to Hoppy, like we just talked about. And then she sank an additional half a million into renovating and furnishing the chic four-bedroom, three-bathroom home. The corner unit featured 12-foot ceilings, hardwood floors, and a 180-bottle wine fridge, as well as a main suite with a walk-in closet and massive in-suite bathroom with a double vanity, soaking tub, and separate steam shower. That has to be the height of luxury in a New York apartment. Oh, yeah. So when they got divorced, the loft became a point of contention, as we discussed. And ultimately, though, Bethany came out on top. She listed the dwelling for $6.95 million in 2016 and sold it in one day at full asking price. So then in January 2017, Jason was arrested in his Manhattan apartment just four hours after she claimed that he rushed at her and Dennis Shields, who was her boyfriend at the time, after they dropped Bryn off at the school. He began to scream at Dennis and Bethany. He screamed, there's nothing you can do to stop me. You'll be sorry. You've been warned. I can't help it. Okay. Why can't he help it? Come on, dude. I know. So he said, yeah. He then told Shields that Bethany was, quote, pure evil before adding, quote, you've been warned. Don't say I didn't warn you. And it says prior to that, Hoppy had sent over 150 emails in less than three months to Frankel. This after he called her complaints that he was harassing her comical and told her, quote, I'll never go away. He was charged with harassment in the second degree and stalking in the fourth degree. A NYPD spokesperson told Daily Mail, For contacting, quote, the female victim numerous times via email and FaceTime, as well as approaching her and making verbal threats. So there were witnesses to this at the school that saw him screaming at her. Bethany was granted a six-month restraining order the following day, which prohibited Hoppy from speaking with her or an unnamed third party involved in the incident. That's probably Shields. I want to talk real quick about this. Bethany talked about it on her Just Be podcast, and she said that by having her assistants help her collect all of the records of the FaceTime calls, text messages, emails, and then categorizing them and putting them in binders with tabs and creating exhibits for the court, that once there were witnesses to him screaming at her and she was able to make a police report, then she was able to give all of that to the police in order to back up her claims. And that also eventually went to the court again in the further divorce proceedings, but her attorneys said that she saved herself, according to Bethany, $150,000 in legal and paralegal fees by doing all of that herself and making it super organized, which that is something you have to do. You have to be organized. This goes (laughs) back to the question we received on our AMA. We didn't ask me anything on the Bravo Real Housewives subreddit. And someone asked, like, who would we, we want to defend? And I said anyone who has created binders for a reunion <laughs> because they just come with all their evidence and you go through it. Yeah. And it's like, great. So good job, Bethany. She did it. Like, she's another one that created her own binder. I have to say, if you 
unfortunately are going through something like this. Your attorney will say keep tabs of everything. And it's awful. You're having to organize and categorize abusive behavior, but you have to have evidence for the court in order to get any type of restraining order or back up anything you're saying. Whatever makes it easier for the court to go your way is helpful. And that goes for any proceeding. And to the extent you can get communication in writing, get it. It is yeah. so helpful. Verbal things are harder to prove. Just get everything in writing, which the fact Jason that he messed was, up. He, it's like, <laughs> the fact that after 150 emails in what, how long, what did they say? 150 emails in less than three months. There was the text messages, the FaceTime calls that she recorded, all of that stuff. And it's, I, it's surprising to me that he wasn't afraid to send that many emails with that type of stuff in it. We always say the E in email stands for evidence. Like, Why are you putting it in writing? <laughs> right. That just, to me, shows how off his rocker he yeah. was during all this. Unhinged. Like, you could not even bother to, I don't know, I don't know, to just stop. Like, you couldn't just stop. He could not help himself. And, like, for what point? Just to hurt her. Probably just to provoke a response. I think Bethany is actually very good at listening to her attorneys and taking legal advice and doing what she's told. And she obviously didn't engage and was told not to, which you're not supposed I mean, yeah, it's like, it's like, don't respond, don't engage. So he's trying to provoke any kind of response out of her which apparently led to him actually confronting her in public in front of witnesses. So Hoppy's attorney, Robert C. Got- Gottlieb, reported to the charges against his client by telling the Daily Mail, we look forward to having all of the evidence and truth exposed in a courtroom. And then in a statement to Daily Mail at the time, Frankel's lawyer, Barry Zone, said that the charges against Hoppy come after Bethany endured a great deal of abuse from her ex. Quote, Ms. Frankel's decision to report Mr. Hoppy's abusive behavior followed years of systematic bullying, harassment, stalking, and torment on almost a daily basis. Quote, indeed, Mr. Hoppy has sent hundreds of escalating texts and emails to Ms. Frankel, her assistants, and her boyfriend, demanding that she meet with Mr. Hoppy unnecessarily, saying that I'll never go away and that you left me no choice but to go to extremes, claiming that her definition of harassment is comical and that he will continue to communicate with her as he sees fit, requesting copies of her life insurance policy and telling her, I'll pray for you. Like, what does he want? You know, I mean, I know, I know you, you said he wants a reaction out of her. Sometimes people just they want a response. They want to force you to engage. And then, unfortunately, they will keep escalating things until they can hopefully get something from you. Anyone that's ever been in that situation, it's just awful. Like You feel like you're being hunted. So to resolve the charges, Hoppy agreed to a plea deal under the terms he was to stay away from Frankel for six months in order to have the charges dismissed, according to page six, a stipulation that also prolonged the divorce proceedings. So yeah, the divorce is still going on at this time. Yeah. And then August 2017, the divorce or separation was a topic of discussion on one of the Real Housewives of New York reunions. Bethany said it's been a very negative, inexplicable situation. It's been $3 million in legal fees. I have to work really effing hard to make that. You can't imagine the torment, she told Andy. She said any resolution is legally mandated, and I'm fine with that. I don't care what happens. I have faith that somehow I will be able to live a normal, free life. But it has to be with zero contact, because with any contact, this will not end. So somebody pointed out on Reddit when I was doing some research for this that they thought that it was really compelling that none of the other Roni housewives ever said anything negative about B with regard to the divorce or anything. And they they all actually seemed to feel very bad for her and be on her side pretty uniformly. But all of them have no problem pointing out when Bethany is, you know, crossed the line or done something they don't like. Or I mean, Ramona said horrible things to Bethany, like, you don't have any friends and you're going to die alone. But even Ramona appeared to be very much on Bethany's side throughout this. And so I, I actually do think that that's kind of telling because I'm sure they witnessed some of this. Well, hold up. Don't give Ramona that much credit because she did say that Bethany did like a topless film or something. And how does your daughter feel about that? She said that to Bethany. You don't remember that? <laughs> oh, my God. Was that while the divorce was going on? Yeah. Still? And, and Bethany freaked Ramona. out on her. Yeah. So OK, well, I, I tried to just say that Ramona wasn't an a-hole about one thing, but <laughs> it's going to be proven wrong. Yeah. I think that Not was that when I'm a Ramona in, um... apologist. I just thought maybe it was telling that even Ramona, who is an a-hole, was not picking on Bethany about this. Yeah, I think it was when they were in 
Cartagena, Colombia, I think. Oh. Damn it, Ramona, that was an a-hole move, but that's true to form. April 2018, Dennis Shields proposed to Bethany. Then in August 2018, the custody case got really ugly when Jason questioned Bethany's ability to parent after the death of Shields from a suspected opioid overdose. Hoppy argued that Frankel sometimes left Bren in Shields' care, which he described as a questionable decision. And... Bethany apparently fighting back tears. Hoppy's lawyers went on to suggest that she herself may have an alcohol problem by pointing to footage of her on The Real Housewives of New York City where she's inebriated. And then they said Dennis Shields spent a great deal of time with Bren and even cared for Bren at times when Ms. Frankel wasn't around. Quote, considering Mr. Shields' addiction, what does that say about Ms. Frankel's parenting, that she would allow this person to care for her daughter? This doesn't just constitute a lapse in judgment. This was downright dangerous parenting, Hoppy's attorney, Robert Wallach, told the court, according to page six, which attended the hearing. Wallach went on to make reference to a recent episode of the Bravo show in which Frankel appears as proof of her apparently dangerous parenting. There's a recent episode in which she appeared to be intoxicated. Quote, she was running around without clothes on and then she passed out and it was said she passed out from mixing Ambien with alcohol. Quote, our concerns are whether Ms. Frankel may have some type of substance abuse problems. So we would ask the court to order drug testing of Ms. Frankel to find out if that's an issue, he said. I know how I feel about that. <laughs> how do you feel about that? I'm so pissed off. I oh, my God, I'm so angry. <laughs> Okay, one instance of her having fun on a show where she's supposed to have fun, and that's her job, or one of her jobs. Come on. And then using Dennis's death. Oh, oh my God. Of course, they I'd... have to use everything that they can to try and make it seem like, well, they don't have to. They don't no, have they to. Don't it doesn't have, have to. to be like this. It does not. It. This is where, if anyone's seen the movie A Marriage Story, I feel like that was actually a really realistic portrayal of a divorce and how different types of things happen when different types of attorneys can get involved. It's got Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson in it. And it's it's a well-acted movie. And the older attorney that is like, hey, you don't want to start a war. I can imagine Jason going to his attorneys and saying, okay, well, this happened. How do we use this to our advantage? Or maybe it was the attorney's idea saying, well, I think we need to ask for this. But it was just really untoward. Her fiance dies that's a horrible situation. And then he's trying to make her look bad. But this is the hearing where I was able to read part of the transcript that page six or somebody had posted. And this is the one where she was able to defend herself by telling the judge, if they want to try to use the show against me, you're going to have to watch the entire show because they only take snippets out of it. It's out of context. And she did a phenomenal job arguing to the court about how, one, this is a waste of the court's time and resources. Two, this is one incident taken out of months of filming for hours and hours and hours at a time. And if you're going to make a ruling based on this as evidence, you're going to have to watch all of it. And the judge is just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. And I agree with you, Bethany. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fair argument. And then 2019, Bethany sues Jason again for full custody. As you will recall, earlier in the episode, we said that she gave up the initial custody proceedings and did a co-parenting agreement. But of course, after the arrest, after all this other stuff, she tried to get full custody of Bryn. So in his opening statement, Bethany's attorney said they want to modify the decision-making agreement so that Bethany would be awarded sole custody and sole decision-making power to prevent further harm to Bryn, as well as minimize Jason's interaction with Bryn or have it supervised. The attorney accused Hoppy of cruel treatment and disdain of Frankel in front of the child, which he argued will affect Bryn's relationship not only with them, but with other people in the future. He called what Jason has done to Frankel domestic violence to cause emotional and psychological harm and alleged that it continues to this day. He accused Hoppy of physically pulling Bryn away from Bethany when they were living together. He would leave out cruel press about Bethany for her to see. And he locked up their dog Cookie in a storage closet for hours and did not tell Bethany her whereabouts. That is awful. You do not mm. mess with the dog. I know it's so sad. In the first season, they were like having a family meeting and it was, if you didn't know what was going to happen later on, it was so cute. So they're all sitting there at the table. Jason's holding Bren as a baby and Bethany's sitting there and then they've got her assistant there. And then Jason calls out. He's like taking roll call, basically. He called out Cookie's name. Cookie barked and answered. He said, OK, Cookie is present. We're all here. And it was like, oh, it's so cute. I wish this didn't end so horribly. According to Bethany's attorney, 
Poppy sent cruel texts and emails to Frankel calling her desperate and saying things like, quote, Ugh, this is what 43 looks like. Additionally, Bethany's attorney said Hoppy attacked Frankel's romantic relationship, saying that they won't last and even sent attacks directly to significant others. Over a one day and night period, Bethany's attorney said that Hoppy sent Frankel over 500 emails. He also claimed that he sent his attacks of Frankel to Bren's school and has said things to Bren like, don't worry, you'll soon be back with daddy who loves you and mommy won't let me call you. Bethany's attorney argued that Hoppy hadn't gotten any better after their financial settlement and initial custody agreement and that his behavior will only change with the consequence. They had a therapist that testified, Dr. Rabbits, who called Hoppy's behavior outrageous and said that no change is forthcoming. And Bethany's attorney argued that Frankel is the parent who can move forward and make decisions without the need to punish Hoppy and will promote a positive relationship between Bren and her father. Bethany's attorney alleged that Hoppy is controlled by his emotions and hovers over Bren during her communications with Frankel, even when Bren is doing her homework, and that, quote, even the child has expressed discomfort with his behavior. And then Bethany testified and said, until something stops, you don't realize how traumatic and damaging it is. When the person is arrested, you're sleeping better, you're not stressed, you're physically more psychologically healthy, you're not a wreck all the time. It's like you can have a slightly normal life and you're more connected with Bryn because you're not in a panic about what will happen with the emails. Bethany's lawyers said, quote, the father's behavior before and after their marriage is extremely harmful to Bryn. He continued, his abusive behavior toward her not only damages her relationship with her mother, but to everyone else in her life. This was really compelling to me, looking at it from a legal perspective. The pair's former co-parenting coordinator detailed his experience working with the pair in court. He testified that he could get through to Bethany to some degree, but he could not get through to Jason or convince him to let go of his anger toward Bethany. He told the court that during the 15 years he's worked in co-parenting, he had only excused himself from one other case. So that is really compelling because that's a third party that doesn't have either person's side, and it's supposed to be an objective coordinator who looks at both parties and helps them work through their stuff, and is also so that they don't have to talk directly to each other. And the fact that he said that about Jason, well, not totally letting Bethany off the hook, but at least saying like, okay, he was able to get through to her and basically backing up what the therapist said. I think that's very compelling. Jason's attorney in response said that they knew the deal. They agreed to the deal. More importantly, they knew each other, yet they entered into this binding agreement. He said, although he wouldn't expand on Bethany's provocations, inflexibility, and quote, need for attention, He alleged that her and her team want the court to believe the former couple is so hostile with each other that they need to throw out the old co-parenting agreement. Jason's attorney also alleged that Bethany sent emails of fights with Jason about phone access to Bryn to her assistants and told them to print them and keep them in her file. Then in 2017, she went to the police with a packet of emails and Jason was arrested on stalking and harassment charges. Quote, I didn't think the mother of my child would want to have me arrested, he said during his cross-examination. He said, when I was arrested, that scared the shit out of me. When the charges were dismissed, she then demanded full custody three days later, citing the timing as suspicious. Well, the charges were dismissed because it was a plea, right? Yeah, that's his attorney. That's his (laughs) attorney making attorney arguments. Yeah. Saying... Well, you know, the charges were dismissed. Well, they were dismissed because essentially you got a, like a diversion or suspended imposition yeah. of sentence. So, I mean, this actually, I think, helps prove Bethany's case because he had a consequence. And then as soon as he had a consequence, his behavior changed. He didn't want to get arrested again. So he stopped sending all the emails and stopped doing all that. But he hadn't had a consequence until then. So I feel like even the attorney's arguments is good of a job as they're doing to try to reframe what's going on. That actually helps Bethany's arguments. Yeah, and it's like, oh, how dare she go with a packet of emails that my client sent her and how dare get him she arrested? Keep track how of all this abusive dare? behavior? How <laughs> dare? And it's like, okay, so he did send the emails and he was harassing her, but how dare Bethany try and compose that evidence and get him arrested? How dare? Come on. Yeah, I mean, he's trying to turn around and make it sound like she has a vendetta against him, but it really, it's like, actually, I'm saving myself legal fees by having my assistant keep track of this stuff because. I've learned now that that's what I need to get the court to believe me about what's going on. Yeah. How dare you build a case against my client who's harassing you? My lord. So Hoppy's attorney argued that the pair's communication has been less hostile than in the past. I like how they're saying he's saying it's less hostile. 
It's because he doesn't want to get arrested again. Mm -hmm. And that co-parenting is working. And he went on to argue that while Brent is doing great, Frankel's insistent on making this about her and Hoppy. And this is Jason's attorney saying, quote, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it, said Wallach, who said the current agreement is, quote, working reasonably well. He closed by stating that Frankel is seeking publicity and called the trial an unnecessary evil. During his cross-examination, Hoppy said, I think we are both good parents and I just want to move on. Quote, there are probably some statements we both made to each other that we regret. The cross-examination also saw an apology from Hoppy, who said, quote, I take full responsibility for the comments I have made, referring to the custody arrangement that prevents both parties from disparaging each other. Bethany's attorney proceeded to read numerous texts that Hoppy had sent to Frankel from 2015 to 2017. They included, quote, a happy person doesn't do what you do. You're exactly like your mother. You're a sad, bitter person for keeping a child away from her father. Which boyfriend do you have now, Bethany? All of which Hoppy took responsibility for and said he regretted sending them. He also looked at Frankel and apologized to her directly a few times. This kind of sounds like his attorneys saying, look, you have to take responsibility for your actions. You have to show that you are capable of being reasonable and not doing these things because this is what is forming the basis of her argument for having sole custody of the child. Then the cross-examination of Hoppy continued and it addressed Shields' death. I guess Jason ended up admitting that he would text Dennis. And he said he did so in hopes that Dennis would convince Bethany to have Bryn call him. He said things to Bethany and Dennis as, quote, you'll be sorry, you've been warned, she's pure evil, don't say I didn't warn you. There's nothing you can do to stop me. He admitted to sending those because he was shocked that Dennis was at the playground with Bryn. And I'm not, please don't think I'm excusing anything that Jason is doing because I'm talking about just hypothetical, rational, normal people. It has to be incredibly hard when you get divorced and then having your ex date somebody you don't know or perhaps don't necessarily approve of and then having that person around your child. I can understand why that would be difficult for anybody. Mm -hmm. The way Jason's behaving is completely inappropriate and wrong. And obviously he's got some revenge, anger, whatever. I don't, I can't diagnose him. I don't know whatever issues he has, but there's something going on that made him behave this way. But I think even a normal person who didn't have those tendencies would have a hard time dealing with that. And that's understandable, but you can't behave like this. Mm -hmm. Right. And then he further admitted that the way he was contacting and talking to Bethany was, quote, wrong and inappropriate and said that he now contacts her through his surrogate every other day if he hasn't heard from Bryn. He, quote, said, you don't see any more communication like this from 2017 on. He said he was trying not to use attorneys to bring up issues with the agreements and he was trying to meet with her so they wouldn't use lawyers, but admitted that his emails and texts were a horrible approach. So then with respect to Dennis Shields, the judge said that Hoppy and his team were trying to use his debt to their advantage. And the clear implication being that it was inappropriate that they were trying to use that tragedy. Still, Hoppy stood by his previous request, and this is about Hoppy requesting drug tests for Bethany after Shields died, and said, quote, if this were reversed, I believe Bethany would do the same, said Hoppy, who argued that any parent would have some concern when their co-parent's boyfriend dies of an overdose. Ahead of the trial, Hoppy said that, quote, he was hoping to meet with Bethany and that he, quote, never wanted to be here or have it escalate to this level and that our daughter will see this. My approach is Bryn should be with both of us, said Hoppy, who added, there have been a lot of emails that have been positive co-parenting. And then in November 2016, Hoppy claimed that he sent Frankel an email about doing better and co-parenting better. And as of January 2017, he had stopped with the nasty text because he was tired of it and wanted to move on. But Bethany's attorney argued that wasn't the case. And in October, November 2016, Hoppy was asking Frankel for full custody of Bryn. And then months later in January 2017, Bethany's attorney said that Hoppy took the issues between him and Frankel to Bryn's school, sending an email to Bryn's teacher saying that he hadn't heard from Bryn or Frankel. And then Bethany's attorney said the only reason the disparaging contact stopped in January 2017 is that an order of protection was issued against him, which is what we were saying. Yeah, (laughs) it's not because he he was trying to be a better co-parent. And then I think this was around the time that Ramona made the comment about the booby stuff. March 5th, 2019, from page six, Bethany Frankel's ex tried to blame her after their daughter was rejected from Friends Seminary Day School, according to an email revealed in court on Tuesday. Bethany responded via email and said, quote, perhaps they are aware of your cousin being incarcerated as a pedophile, your uncle's overdose or your cousin's identity theft. 
You're absurd. Pull it together, she said. I think the discussion about the booby thing was Ramona was like, I think your daughter maybe got kicked out of school because they found your your booby videos. That that just like triggered a memory in my brain. Mm. And this her email back to him was in response to Jason forwarding Bethany the rejection email from the school. And in it, he said, quote, that her fame and fortune as a TV personality was ruining opportunities for Bryn. Quote, it seems that our daughter is being disadvantaged solely because of her mother. So that's when Bethany responded saying, yeah. well, maybe they're aware your cousin's incarcerated as a yeah. pedophile, your uncle's overdose, or your cousin's identity theft. <laughs> Which honestly seems like maybe a fair response if he's saying, oh, she didn't get accepted because you're on a reality show. And then she's kind of like, well, maybe she didn't get accepted because of all the stuff going on in your family. So I, don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, who knows why she got rejected? I just it's so frustrating that he can send her 500 nasty texts and emails and then she has one response and then it's written about. Yeah, it's frustrating. But this is also after the 2017 time when he said he stopped to be a better parent. Like, clearly you didn't. This is in 2019. Just to be clear, later, Hoppy's attorney, Robert Wallach, denied that his client had a pedophile cousin. I didn't see any denials of the other things. so Maybe those are true. Good to know. Thank you. Sorry, that's not, I don't know why I'm laughing. So now we're on to March 2019. On the third day of their bitter custody hearing in Manhattan Supreme Court on Wednesday, Frankel described in detail how Hoppy tried to turn their eight-year-old daughter, Brent against her, turned her life into a torture chamber, and again, repeated the stuff about what happened when they were having to share the same apartment. So among the more disturbing anecdotes that Frankel gave was one in which she described Hoppy drawing a picture of her beloved dog, a cookie, and leaving it in Brent's lunchbox for her to find. Just a day after the dog died, it was signed Dad. Can I tell you a story that yes. kind of reminds me of my former boyfriend sent me a beautiful flower arrangement that included a, a cute little white dog made out of flowers for Valentine's Day one year. And that same day, my little white Maltese family dog died. <gasps> and he was like oh my God, don't take the flowers to be that I was sending you them because if like it's not related to the dog. I didn't know the dog was going to oh. die. But it was like, oh my God. <laughs> I appreciated the flowers even still, but it was just, Aww. yeah. So it's Valentine's Day and your, your doggy yeah. dies. Yeah. Oh, and then he happened to just send a flower arrangement in the shape of your dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Really bad timing. And I, I don't imagine that Hoppy like drew the picture before the dog died but yeah he explains it later on so we'll talk about his response to some of these other accusations but so this is again in the custody trial and this is Bethany saying I have a video that happened on May 9th 2015 and it was Mother's Day weekend and Bren's birthday weekend the circumstances were that I was trying to FaceTime Bren and as I have experienced every day Jason was using it as a tool to harass and assault me Frankel told the court through tears in the FaceTime, Frankel asks, can I talk to Bryn for a sec? And Hoppy responds, no, keep recording me, keep recording me. You lost your privilege when you began recording me. After the FaceTime played in court, Frankel said Hoppy used the calls to abuse her. Jason would use FaceTime calls to taunt me and to abuse me and just basic torture and taunting every day. Is everything okay, Bethany? You seem upset, Bethany. Did you have a bad day, Bethany? She wanted to say Hoppy was often shirtless or without clothes in the FaceTime calls, which made her feel uncomfortable. Bethany claimed the tension had a dramatic effect on her relationship with Bren. So then she was cross-examined by Hoppy's attorney, and it was revealed that she called Jason white trash and once threw water on him when he was sleeping. And we spoke about this earlier. It's probably like the one accusation that they have against her that she's admitted to. This is the cross-examination. You called him white trash, correct? And she said, I think I called his family that. And then he impeached her by bringing out the transcript from the 2014 divorce hearing where she had said during the hearing that she called Hoppy White Trash after he told her he found an investor to fund his divorce battle. And then Wallach then says, you called him White Trash. And then she said yes. So this is an example of being impeached by former testimony because yeah. in a divorce hearing under oath, she said that she called him white trash. Then in this proceeding, she said, no, I called your family white trash. And now the attorney's like, aha, no, you actually called him white trash. So Yeah, I don't think that was particularly effective. No. <laughs> it's just kind of like, she's not didn't really denying anything. And it's not like he caught her in some like 
red-handed lie or smoking gun. I just yeah. looks like he's kind of beating her up on the stand and then he having to pull out the transcript and then be like, oh, well, you called him white trash after he found an investor to fund his divorce action against you. Yeah, that's almost... That doesn't make Jason look good either. No. <laughs> it's like... And the thing is, like, in court when this happens, it's not seamless. Like, yeah. Like, once someone says something that you know was testified to in a different way before, then you have to go, like, find the page number and the quote. And well, it takes a it, little bit of time. And I, I know It can get probably... seamless. With, like, if you, I mean, when I go in for cross-examination, I'm loaded for bear. And so it's like, oh, I've yeah, got yeah, it yeah. All. He probably yeah. had it, but it's it doesn't read. The, it's not like this. It's probably a beat. Like, it's there's a, a moment where he has to go and then the jury's waiting. What's the big reveal? Like, what actually did she say? And then it's just like, oh, she called him white trash, not his family. So yeah. you're waiting for the big piece of evidence that this attorney has and it's nothing cool yeah and then so yeah he, he so he goes on and he says this is hobby's attorney there was a time where he was sleeping and you threw water at him correct and bethany says i don't know if he was sleeping but i threw water on him again <laughs> she's like <laughs> not denying wallach then had frankel look at a specific page of the 2014 testimony in which she said i splashed water at him while he was sleeping i cracked which also supports what we were saying. If you have someone pushing your buttons constantly every single day, tormenting you, and then you crack once, that's the things that make this so emotional is that you're having to sit there and it's so unfair that you're having to defend yourself. He sat there and tortured me every single day for months and then I crack once and now I'm being cross-examined about whether he was asleep or not when I, I've already admitted to throwing water on him. Sensi's mm-hmm. absolutely right. This is not effective because you probably had to sit there, flip through, find the page that he's referring to. He's not making her look bad by doing no. this. So May 2019, this is still the trial. And this is where Jason is testifying. And so Jason testified that Bran was absent from school a total of eight days this year, six of which occurred on Bethany's watch. I don't really know how that's relevant. Like, what if she just happens to get sick or need to be out on the days that she's with Bethany? Why is that? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, feel but. like that's that many days either. No. And also, I don't think anyone was going to believe that Bethany didn't want Bryn to be educated. Then speaking of Bryn's attendance for her first grade school year, Jason revealed she missed 16 days, 15 of which he claimed were also on Bethany's watch. During the cross-examination, Jason also detailed their failed marriage, saying it went downhill in 2012 after Bethany started her Skinny Girl brand. Prior to that deal, we were on equal footing. We were a team and a partnership, Jason said. Then the deal happened and it seemed like I was beneath her. She made a lot of money in that deal and my job was meaningless. It was no longer a partnership, he said. Anything that I would do was not good enough. That just makes him sound bitter that she became successful. According to reporting, it wasn't until Jason accused Bethany of airing their dirty laundry to the press that she got heated. After explaining he was furious about interviews she was giving regarding the failed marriage, Bethany sobbed in court in the middle of Jason's testimony yelling, you tortured me, you tortured me. Again, like we were talking about, it's this is all very emotional stuff and you're watching someone that promised to love you forever on the stand claiming that you're doing things wrong. It makes a lot of sense how you would snap, like watching them try to make you look bad just by being yourself and having your business or whatever. Yeah. And then she got reprimanded by the judge and said, Miss Frankel, this is Mr. Hoppy's testimony. So she had an outburst during him testifying. Bethany then stormed out of the courtroom after the judge ordered a break, where she was seen on a couch in the lobby telling her new boyfriend, Paul Burnin, quote, he tortured me and is lying. But this is all reporting. We don't we don't know. Yeah. So this is uh, still in the trial. This is all the way into June 2019. And this is where Jason is explaining about the drawing that he'd put into Bryn's backpack of cookie. So we'd already talked about how he put the drawing in the backpack and that Bethany believed that this was a malicious and cruel act when the drawing of cookie was put in Bryn's backpack. And she said that Bryn had witnessed Cookie died from a seizure just days before, and everybody loved Cookie. Cookie was actually one of the better behaved dogs, too, on Roni. <laughs> I really liked Cookie. I liked Cookie, too, but if you followed Bethany on social media at the time, we all saw Cookie dying. I d- did not like that. Wait, Bethany's... that was filmed? I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. She put it on her Instagram stories that Cookie was having seizures, and she was crying on her Instagram stories. And I was like, this is too much for me. Oof. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think I follow Beth- Bethany on Instagram. You shouldn't. I don't, I I'm mean, glad I missed that one. I would not follow her. Okay. She she details every, like, 20 minutes of her life. 
I don't know if it's like this now, but back then when I was following her, you know how you could see how many posts someone has put on their stories and it's yeah. broken up by little lines? Her was just filled. Filled. It was like hundreds a day. That's she exhausting. Documented, like I... every bit of her life, including the death of Cookie. Oh. I just see her on TikTok. Obviously, TikTok pays attention to everything I do, so it knows I like cats and Real Housewives. So there, it's constantly showing me Bethany talking about makeup on TikTok, mm. but I don't follow her. Okay, so here's what Hoppy said. On the witness stand, Jason insisted that he was just helping Bryn grieve. He said that the day after the dog died, quote, we went to church. We lit candles. We both drew pictures of Cookie. And he said, I loved Cookie. And he admitted that he failed to tell Bethany that he would be speaking to Bryn about Cookie's death. And he said, I regret not including Bethany in that conversation. So he's just saying that he put in, it was supposed to be like a nice cute reminder of Cookie. Yeah, I mean, and when he explains that in context, it's lighting a candle, honoring Cookie's life. Then they both drew pictures of, I mean, that that doesn't sound like an unreasonable way to grieve over the death of a pet with a child. But I suppose without context, and especially if you're Bethany and he's actively doing everything he can to torture you, not having any context, you would look at it in the most negative light possible. When I first read Bethany's telling of the dog drawing i didn't think it was a negative malicious thing that he was trying to do because even still i still think he loves bryn and i don't think he would have wanted her to see something that would hurt her even if bethany saw it yeah his whole dynamic with his family is just you know his brother died and it was obvious from watching the show that he felt like he had to help fill that void for his parents so then they're also arguing over religion bethany converted to judaism and we watched on the show that Jason and his family are Catholic, so another layer of opposites. And so I guess they're fighting over how she's going to be raised with regard to religion. So at the end of the trial, it was assumed post-trial briefs were due August 21st for both of them. And it was expected that the judge would decide on custody within two months. September 2020, Bethany confirmed she's still legally married to Jason during an interview with Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live. Andy Cohen asked her about her current relationship with Paul Burnham and asked if they plan on getting married. And she shocked the producers with her response, I'm still married. Crickets again and seen. And we're back and we're walking. Then finally, January 2021, their divorce is finalized. So was that nine years, seven years? Nine? A lot of years. A lot, Many a years. Long, close to a decade. Yeah. Which I know everyone was like, why did it take so long? Maybe now after we've gone through everything and how contentious it was, the property issues, the financial issues, the custody issues, it makes sense. That is why. Do we know what the custody decision was? So she's the primary parent. She was found to be the primary parent. And at this point, Brian was old enough to have some say And Bryn made the decision to live primarily with Bethany, but they did agree to split the child custody. Hoppy showed up for the hearing without representation and read a prepared statement that said he would not be fighting his ex and her request. Quote, this is not a Bryn issue or an issue that Bryn has with me. He told the judge, therefore, I'm removing myself from this fight for Bryn for my physical, emotional, mental health. I will not spend the remainder of Bryn's childhood fighting as we share joint physical custody. Bryn knows I love her and... I want her and I will always be available for our time together. Jason said, I'm removing myself from this toxic environment. It's not good for myself or Bryn. Yeah, so I think it means that she has sole legal custody, but they have joint physical custody. There's two different statuses in New York. Part of the big issue was with the custody was there was a very specific custody order in place saying like at this specific time, Bryn would stay with her father and the pickup and drop off would be at this location. The court trying to resolve some of these issues and the arguments made it very, very specific. But then Bethany pointed out in court proceedings that Bren, she's not a piece of property. She's a living, breathing human being. And sometimes she just cries and refuses to go and she doesn't want to go. This is a real person. I'm not going to force her to get out of the car and go if she doesn't want to. And the court, finally, they were able to kind of recognize that. I think maybe at a certain point, Jason realized like, this is this is a battle he cannot continue to fight. And I think getting arrested really was the best thing because it seemed like the ties started to turn after that. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think they have a lot more freedom now. Bryn has a lot more freedom to say, oh, I want to go stay with my dad or I want to stay with my mom. And there isn't such a strict rule, although technically they have 50-50 physical custody. There isn't those stringent guidelines in place of you have to turn her over at this date and time. And then before adjourning, the judge in the case 
reprimanded both of them and said, quote, I'm hoping that this will be the last time that I need to see you. I think both parties have spent quite a bit of time in court litigating these issues. I hope by making a minor adjustment to the schedule, it will make things more comfortable for Bryn. A divorce lawyer from New York wrote a blog about this, and her name is Martha Cohenstein, and she commented and she said, looking back over the legal proceedings that spanned an eight-year period, in my opinion, one decision that Bethany made that hurt her and that she later came to regret was her decision not to finish the first custody trial that started in 2014. Instead of completing the trial, a lengthy, stressful, and expensive process and hoping the judge would see things her way and award her sole physical custody and sole decision-making, she cut off the proceedings and entered into a joint custody agreement with Jason. However, things were too volatile between the two exes, and Stein felt that a joint custody agreement was just not going to work. And she said that that really only works when the parties are amicable, get along well, and are able to co-parent cooperatively. And that clearly has not been the case here. And she said that their custody battle only got more intense after the arrest because Frankel had to modify the joint custody agreement. At that time, she had to go back into court and ask for a modification so that she could obtain sole custody of Brandon and sole decision making. And that's why they had the second custody trial. And then she had to prove in that second custody trial the the circumstances had changed since the date of the first agreement and that Jason's hostility was clear and that he was unable to cooperatively co-parent with her and make joint decisions. But there's just like a whole lot of things that compounded that. The amount of money involved, the fact that Jason could apparently get someone to help fund his divorce proceedings presumably for, a, I guess, a cut of whatever he would take. I don't know how that's ethical. And then the continued custody arrangement and the fact that it is so hard to prove these things. Some of the texts in isolation that he sent may not sound so bad, but when there's 500 of them in a row and constant emails and it's having to sit and collect all of that stuff until it, he finally yelled at her in front of witnesses, that took a long time. The trust, that took a long time to invalidate the legal process does not move quickly. It just doesn't Mm -hmm. when both sides are so contentious. And there is just so many factors that took this forever. Right, right. And I think even myself, I'm not a family attorney. When, like, as a fan, seeing this play out, I was like, why can't they just get the divorce and then have these proceedings just happen outside of the divorce? Just doesn't make any sense. But then realizing that the custody, the property separation is all part of the divorce. And that is why it took so long. They had a lot of things they were arguing over. And that's just the way it was. So now she is officially divorced. She has Bryn. Bryn is more public on her social media now. Yeah, she is. I've actually seen her on a TikTok. I think. Yeah. And I think she is still engaged to Paul. But I don't know. If I were Bethany, I would probably be like Oprah and never get married again. <laughs> Just not not going to do it. Yeah, like not worth it. All right. So that's that. Anything you want to say as we close this saga of Bethany's divorce out? Yeah, just uh, thank you again for all of the support from our patrons. And if you guys have questions, please go to our Patreon We know we covered a lot of stuff with these episodes, so ask your questions there. We do try to prioritize answering those questions. And then always follow us on Instagram. We are excited about the next episodes we have coming up. We've got our Patreon Zooms. And then also we've got some really cute merch, and we are working on getting our other merch out for your JD and reality TV. So we will post when we have that released. Yeah, our Zooms are awesome. We just chit-chat. We answer questions. Really fun. We love our Supreme Court members. But yeah, thank you as always for listening. And until next time, bye. Bye, legal team.